By the time the iron nail, which was about seven inches long, was driven into his wrist, Jesus had already carried the near 100-pound crossbar hundreds of yards, and he'd been savagely beaten, flesh torn from his body, even before his agonizing walk began, just as Isaiah had prophesied. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. The soldiers of the governor had made sure to take the time to humiliate him when they'd had Jesus all to themselves. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. Now atop the hill, it's doubtful Jesus saw the hammer being raised high above his head through his swollen, blood-soaked eyes. Still, it came down with ferocious venom pounding through his flesh. By this time, the Romans had perfected crucifixion. Like a demented surgeon, the Roman warrior felt for space between the bones of the forearm, the precise spot that would not sever arteries. He must be exact, as the location of this nail must support the weight of Jesus without tearing apart his flesh. I wonder, could Jesus hear the clang of the hammer and nail above screaming jeers and taunts of a hateful crowd, or over the sobbing of those who dared still follow him? As one soldier hammers, another prepares the feet of Jesus for a similar fate, while yet a third laughs, only to spit in his face. The soldier's saliva crawls down the side of Christ's cheek, quickly swallowed up by pools of blood Collecting beneath the crossbar, Jesus is now stretched out upon. Listen carefully now. The sounds are haunting. Too exhausted to scream, our Savior groans weakly. When he can muster enough courage, he breathes deeply. Each breath brings excruciating pain. The steady rhythm of his blood drips to the ground. This prepares the landscape for violent tremors soon to come. The clang of the iron nail driven into his other wrist cues the sun that it's almost time to disappear, hide from view and be replaced with the eerie substitute of darkness. They lift him now. A new torture begins as his cross slowly rises and slams into the ground into an erect position. His crown of thorns digs deeper into flesh and skull. With the exception of a few taunts, it grows quieter. Jesus opens an eye just wide enough to see soldiers gamble for his garments, just as David penned a thousand years before. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. Days before, desperate people reached through crowds simply to touch his clothes and seek the miraculous. Now those clothes are just prizes to be won. The divine nature of Jesus is heard in his prayer, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And the human nature of Jesus is heard in his lament, I'm thirsty. The smell of wine vinegar emanates from a jug beneath the cross and a soaked sponge is lifted to his lips. After committing his spirit to his Father, Jesus declares, it is finished. The sound of thunder moves in while the sun disappears. Down the mountain and across the road, a Roman soldier collecting the instruments of torture they'd used on Jesus hours before is alarmed by the sudden darkness over the mountain above. Then he hears it as the thunder briefly ceases. The curtain of the temple torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth beneath him splits open. The smell of death rests on the mountain. The body on the cross is still. There is no movement now. 
just a continual streaming of blood. Drip by drip, the blood of Christ falls and splatters on the ground. Each drop carrying the assurance that He loves us beyond measure. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that God made Jesus who knew no sin be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. This is why the crucifixion matters. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him, and by His wounds we are healed. This is life-changing news. Yet the brutal death and sacrifice of Christ is not the end of the story. There's greater things in store, and it's just a few days away.